Okay, I guess, I guess we're, we're going to start. Our speaker is Steve Morlidge. I think in the past dozen, 15 years, no one has contributed more lessons to the practice of business forecasting than Steve has. Uh, he's had several decades, I think at least three decades of experience at Unilever as a budgeting and finance professional and expanded on this experience uh, to co-author a book called Future Ready, How to Master uh, Business Forecasting. Uh, this experience also led to a series of articles we printed in Foresight in 2011 and 2012 called The Forecasting Process Guiding Principles. Following that, Steve turned his attention to the subject of forecastability, where he broke some new ground in terms of measuring what is the maximum accuracy, maximum level of accuracy, you can expect, or minimum forecast error, you can expect from any forecasting method, thus helping to put our forecast accuracy metrics in some perspective. Uh, he also created uh, a new uh, forecast accuracy uh, metric to measure forecasting quality in the supply chain, and um, <laughs> wrote a series of articles on forecast quality that received one of the five uh, Foresight Hall of Fame awards for top articles that we printed from the get-go in 2005 through 2017. Uh, today, Steve's talk is based on a pair of articles recently printed in forecasting about a new way to assess uncertainty if you have absolutely minimal information about what might happen in the future. And so through the mathematics of fuzzy forecasting, Steve, along with co-author Paul, uh, developed uh, a, an approach to measuring uncertainty based on not probability distributions, but possibility distributions. So with that, let me turn it over, Steve. Thank you very much, sir. Len. I, I thank you for that. It's, it's, it's going to be downhill from there. That's as good as it gets. OK, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll start off with um, my favorite slide. Oops, jumped ahead, which is a slide about me. Now, I could spend, spend at least 40 minutes talking about that, but uh, I won't today. Um, the point that I want to make here is that uh, I'm very different. I'm the novelty act here in the ISF. I'm very different from almost everybody else who's been standing up and talking in terms of my background, my experience, and consequently my skills. If I talk, of, talk about my skills. My skills are not, a mathema ma not mathematically based. I wouldn't claim, I don't claim to have anything more than sort of a good O level in mathematics. So that's not where my skills lie. I think my skills lie in Having, having had uh, experience as a practitioner for 25 years and a skill in asking stupid questions and not giving up until I get good answers. And, and of course, enlisting people like Paul to help me along the way. Um, so my, my background is very different. And so this is gonna be a very different talk because of that. I'm also not part of a, an academic community. So that, that uh, awful sort of isolation that you all experienced during COVID, where you didn't get, go out of your bedroom for two years or speak to anybody else. That's my life. <laughs> That's me normally. So um, for me, opportunities like this are great be because it gives me the opportunity to share what I've been thinking with other people and for you to help me work out whether what I'm, whether, whether what I'm doing makes sense to sharpen up the communication, but also to enlist your help in terms of ideas that you might have about building on this and ideas which you might have to help operationalize what, uh, what I've been doing. So I'm not showing off, I'm sharing what I've been working on with the hope that some of this will resonate with you and you might help me along my way. 
Uh, thirdly, my motivation. I'm not an academic, so I'm not motivated. I don't have any, any of the academic career aspirations at all. My motivation is purely built on stupid things that I did, and I knew that I, they were stupid when I did them in my career, and just bloody-minded curiosity about how could I have, what, what, how could I have done that better? Um, and the advantage I have, I think, in, in terms of relevance is the stupid things I did are stupid things that everybody like me does. So in, in my old company in Unilever, it wasn't just me doing stupid things. I can confidently assert there were at least 100 other people doing similarly stupid things. So the way I'm thinking is if I can help improve that situation and do things slightly less stupidly, that could potentially have a massive impact, particularly on my community, which is a finance community, not a forecasting community. Um, and the stupid thing that I mentioned that started me off thinking about this is one of the things that I used to do when I first started in Unilever, I used to prepare things called capital proposals. Now, a capital proposal is when you're going to buy a new piece of kit, which might be half a million pounds, a million pounds. I mean, a significant investment. And what you have to do, what you have to do in order to justify that, you have to prepare a DCF analysis, stands for discounted cash flow analysis, whereby you say, over the next 10 years, this is how much money we're going to save, or this is how much revenue that we're going to get from this. Uh, which, as I'm sure, because you're, you're all forecasting professionals, you, you'll realize is a forecast. So any business case you do, any time you do profit planning, almost every planning activity in every business involves a forecast, even though people might not realize that that's what they're doing. So there's me two years out of university preparing these capital proposals. And I very soon realized that there were any number, because you're doing cash flows over 10 years. I mean, 10 years ahead. I mean, it's, it's difficult enough to, to predict three, three months ahead, six months a year. But I was doing 10 years ahead. I could come up with almost any number of plausible numbers um, in that DCF analysis. I, I could, and there was absolutely no way that I could in my head, work out which was the most plausible numbers. And there was absolutely no way I could communicate that to the people who were making a decision. Even worse, so, you know, I was doing all of this work and it was theoretically correct, but I just, this was just a meaningless game. And two years out of university, I recognized it was a meaningless game. Even worse, when you do the DCF analysis, um, you, it, you will only proceed with the investment if, when you've done the DCF analysis, you get an internal rate of return on your project, which is greater than the weighted average cost of capital for the company, which in my days in Unilever is 6%. So if it was 5.99, that wasn't good enough. It was 6.02, that was great, the project went ahead. And that was stupid as well, because that 6% number was, was the result of a complicated calculation which whilst is expressed as a number, which was 6.0000000, in reality, that, was, that wasn't the truth. That, was, that contained within it a, a, a sense of precision, which was entirely false. So we're dealing with two types of imprecisions. We've got an imprecision uncertainty about the future, and then we've got this investment criteria which is really also imprecise, but we pretend it's precise. So we're doing a load of things that involve a load of imprecision, but not recognizing that imprecision, and as a result, making a load of, of, of dumb decisions, I believe. So that's what started me off. Quite why I decided two years ago to start investigating in this, I've completely forgotten, but that was fundamentally the problem. So if I can restate that garbled story in, in, in more uh, uh, structured ways, in the context of forecasting, we talk a lot about the importance of judgment, and we also talk about the importance of recognizing that single points aren't very often aren't terribly useful and ranges aren't useful. Um, 
so the, 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 it's a it's a valid problem if you like in in a in a um uh, to address in a forecasting conference secondly that in my experience the vast majority i put 99 percent, but in my experience the vast majority of decisions which uh, of, of critical decisions rely on judgmental forecast whether for, 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 for reasons of practicality or for uh, simply because you're looking so far ahead in the future you you cannot uh, you don't have the basis to make a forecast which is based on solid statistical criteria so the majority vast ma though i can only think of what i've worked in unilever for 25 years and there was only one occasion where i ever in the context of a decision bro broached the, the the subject of a range and it was dismissed out of hand once in 25 years i don't know anybody i work with who in any of their dis in, in any of their day-to-day business planning and decision making work ever worked with a range yeah um the the irony is judgmentally it is very difficult it's very easy to extract a range you know if i asked you how long do you think it's going to take you to get to heathrow airport on the oxford tube you would say well the timetable says this but i'm i'm guessing that it might be i might get five minutes it might be five or ten minutes quicker than that or it could be half an hour slower than that because of traffic on a friday morning or wherever it is you're going but it's not difficult to extract a range the reason why we don't work with ranges is we don't have a social technology to deal with it we don't know how so we can express ranges but we don't know what to do with those ranges once once we've got them and so what i kind of stumbled on by accident is or thought that might well i reminded myself i'd read a book on fuzzy logic written about 25 years ago and it occurred to me maybe that might be part of the answer and so that if there is an established um, approach to dealing with imprecision where and fuzzy logic was is really aimed at definitional imprecision maybe that could be part of the answer um, but to my surprise that's really I mean it was it kicked off by lofty Z in 1965 so it's been going a long time but it really hasn't got any further than um, uh engineering uh, logic uh, control systems and a little bit on the fringes of or so almost certainly every bit of electronic kit in this room has got is working on fuzzy logic circuits but it's really not gone out outside of that engineering application um so i was thinking that fuzzy logic has been fuzzy sets the idea is is applied to current states of the world and, and definitional problems could you apply that to this problem instead and along the way I've discovered that the whole concept of probability isn't quite as clear-cut and as done and dusted as I thought it was so that's my way of setting the scene I had planned to do this in a kind of modular fashion um, where I'd, I'd talk mainly about the 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 the, the bit in the top left hand corner and we we jump around depending on kind of the questions i got back and the feedback i got back i don't think technologically that's going to be possible so let me let's 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 just start and see where we go so and by the way since there's not many many of us here and you're all a very distinguished audience if you want to ask questions or ask queries chip in as we go through please do that don't hold your questions till the end so long as i can get to the end yeah, and the questions aren't too difficult. That's okay. Um, so there are two foundational sets of ideas here. The first relates to non-additive approaches to probability. Now, I have no idea whether this is I'm saying something that you guys know all about, or whether this is something you've never heard of. Has anybody come across non-additive approaches? Uh, I hadn't until about six or nine months ago basically it goes back to to the early the, the the early sort of infant school when statistics as we now know it was in its infancy that there were a number of people 
who argued that uh, it wasn't sensible to think of probability in additive terms, i.e. that every probability has to add up to one. And the, there are a number of reasons why that not, might not be sensible, but the, if you like, the killer reason is in order to do that, in order to express a statement of probability, I think there is a 30% chance of that happening. You have to know about all, everything that could possibly happen. Everything that could possibly happen, which is inconceivable. Um, think of the situation in Ukraine at the moment. Could you enumerate everything that could possibly happen? Absolutely not. And secondly, that you have, you are, you are ruthlessly rational about, you, you're able to assess the probabilities of all of those possible outcomes in a thoroughly rational and logical fashion, which again is something which is questionable. So, so the people who promoted this idea of non-additional uh, approaches to probability, that's it, if you like, where they were coming from. And there are some distinguished names there. So uh, Knight, Frank Knight, has everybody ever heard of him? He was an economics professor in Chicago. Uh, he drew the distinction between risk and uncertainty. And from what I read in, 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 in respected journals in this field, that distinction is not one that is very often, the words risk and uncertainty are used interchangeably. But what Frank Knight was saying is there is a fundamental difference between risk, which is where you know enough to be able to enumerate the likelihood of something happening with a degree of precision, such that it's almost not uncertain. You know, that's what insurance companies do. It's fundamentally different to uncertainty where you just don't know. You just don't have the data. And these things are fundamentally different and therefore need to be thought of differently and handled in different ways. The second name on that list you might have heard of, the first, um, uh, Maynard Keynes, his PhD thesis was on uh, what he called logical probability. Um, so his first publication, 1921, which you know, Bernard Russell raved about, et cetera, et cetera, made similar points. What, I mean, what he was essentially saying is within certain limits, which is why his approach is called the interval, interval approach, it is always possible to talk about the relative likelihood of things, and that is useful in itself. So even if you're not able to ascribe specific probabilities to things, you can make statements which are useful and helpful and which you can, you can work with. But outside certain ranges, there's some stuff that you simply can't know. And the third one is a chap called George Shackle, who, who made a similar point. He was more interested in these things that were sort of deep uncertainty. But he was saying it, it actually makes much more sense, rather than talking about probabilities, to reverse it and to talk about degrees of surprise. So if you're looking in order to uh, get a sense of the potential likelihood of something, the best way to tackle that is to ask yourself the question, how surprising is this as a potential outcome? So you've got all of these, these guys uh, working in this in, uh, in the early days. It rather sort of, there was a kind of, I wouldn't say battle, but the 1950s was a crucial period because it was 1950s with uh, von Neumann, Morgenstern, uh, Jimmy Savage and people like that who firmly established the uh, additive statistical approach to judgment. And, and these, if you like, this uh, thread of intellectual thought fell out of favor, largely because there was no sex social technology behind it to help you do anything with these ideas. Whereas that's one thing that the statisticians in the 1950s had, they had the social technology, the mass, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first set of uh, foundations. The second one is, is what I mentioned earlier, the whole idea of fuzzy sets, um, which uh, was an idea put forward by this guy Lofty Zedin in 1965. It's made deep inroads into, into um, um, 
uh, machine controls made deep inroads into soft computing, but not out, outside of that. And basically, that was predicated on his insight, is that most of the things that we have to deal with in real life are not black and white, they're shades of grey. Yeah? Uh, and particularly, they're shades of grey if your level of knowledge is low. Yeah? So there's already a conceptual approach for managing imprecision. So what I'm trying to do is to bring those two things together. Right, I'll speed up a little bit now. Um, and I think a good way into this is to try to expose the ontology behind this. So one of the things that, as an outsider, if you like, to the forecasting community, has always struck me, is that nobody ever questions or seems to raise as an issue what is the world that we think we are describing when we do this forecasting thing? What do, what, what do we think the world is that we're forecasting? What is it like? What's the nature of the world? For me, I think it's rather like this, is that you have a certain, you have a high degree of confidence in what's happened in the past. But if you think about what is likely to ha happen in the future, lots of different things can happen. Um, each one of these would represent, if you like, a structural break. Um, and that might be because the system that you're trying to forecast is inherently nonlinear and therefore won't go in a straight line and is inherently predisposed to sort of shoot off in a different direction. And or, because we've all got free will and we can make choices, and the choices that we make will influence the way that the future goes. What's more, it's reflexive. So very often we'll make choices based upon forecasts we've made. So we make, we make a choice to invalidate the forecast that we've made earlier, yeah? So I, I don't think the world, there isn't, if you like, a straight line into the future that, we, that, that we're trying to work out what that straight line is, what that single potential outcome is using complex mass. The reality is the future is potentially lots of different things. And because there's path dependency, once, th once things go off in one particular direction, they're unlikely to go back, revert back to, to uh, if you like, a pre-existing equilibrium. And in, in actual fact, we fool ourselves. We fool ourselves in thinking that the past is clear-cut and uh, known. In reality, we've got a cloud of data points from which we infer what has happened. We don't actually know what's happened. We just infer what's happened. And what we're ignorant of all of the, those things that could have happened, but didn't happen. Yeah? So in my head, that's the world that, that I work in, that I live in. And it's, that's the world that I want to be able to um, handle and manipulate in a, in, a, in a rational and logical way. And a lot of this boils down to the assumptions about equilibria, equilibrium. So if, if classical science and stats assumes a single stable equilibrium. So classical physics, classical economics, classical stats assumes a single equilibrium. Now that, uh, and I'm using here the terms that um, uh, from dynamic systems theory and dissipative systems and all of that kind of stuff. That you, you've got, it, it's like a basin that a ball rolls around in, you know, a bit that's perturbed by random events and, and and ultimately, what you're trying to do is to work out what that single stable equilibrium is. But one thing that to recent work in complexity theory and all of that kind of stuff has told us is that in reality, when systems are nonlinear, it really probably doesn't make sense to think of a, of a single equilibrium. It might not even make sense to think of equilibrium at all. You've got a landscape which your ball is bouncing around across. So, and, at any, and, and your, the future could lie in any one of those basins of attraction. And what we know is that if, that when we look at systems like that, the distributions that come out tend not to be Gaussian-like distributions. They tend to be scale-free distributions, which have a completely different kind of nature altogether. So on top of that, so the way I see it, you've got a bit of the future which is potentially amenable to statistical forecasting, potentially. Um, but then, and you've got all of this multiple 
branching possibilities, but overlaid across that, you've got our ignorance, which is like a fog that descends on it. And that's the world that I think I've been living in. And the guys who, who, uh, who, who, who work in this kind of area talk about different levels of uncertainty. Um, so we've got some kind of, we've got some kind of tech, technology in this level one, level two area. And when you get to level three, you've got scenarios, which is one way of recognizing potential um, alternative outcomes. But this level three in the middle is the level that I worked in for 25 years and all my colleagues worked in for 25 years, where we know that it isn't sensible to talk about single points. We know it isn't sensible to do, dismiss ranges, but we do. We ignore ranges because we don't have the means to deal with them. And, and that's for two reasons. One is we potentially, so what I call epistemological ignorance, we potentially could collect data which will allow us to make, to incorporate uncertainty in our decisions. But we can't because we actually haven't collected the data or we don't have enough time. And you've got ontological uncertainty where it's fundamentally uncertain, where there is no data to collect. Yeah. A Unilever, probably in this area, yeah. But whereas, whereas, you know, when when we were producing uh, revenue forecasts and profit forecasts on a monthly basis, it's more likely here, yeah. So we potentially could there could be information that we could use to um, to make statistically robust judgments about uncertainty, but we simply just didn't have the time, or we don't have the people, the capability to use that information. Yeah, sorry, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question to which I don't have a quick answer. <laughs> but maybe we could talk about it afterwards, but it, it's absolutely right. And also, there is a practical, if, if, if you think of profit forecasting, you're like, so I've got, uh, I don't know, eight business groups, um, and there is a range of uncertainty about the profit forecast for each one of those eight business groups. And each of those eight business groups have 50 product categories, and each of those 50 product categories have 10 SKUs, you know, there is no way judgmentally I'm going to capture a, even if the, uh, the, the machine was there to take them, there's no way I can judgmentally capture the range of uncertainty around each one of those SKUs and build it up into a, a picture for the total company. What I could do is come up with ranges for those eight business units, you know, that is manageable. And that's the limit of my ambition to be particularly, to, to, be, to be clear. So let's kind of try and build, build this up. So I'm trying to build up now uh, sort of logically how I'm I, a, a, a way of thinking through this problem. So I'm trying to draw a distinction between risk where distributions are known or can be estimated reasonably easily and where you've got no fundamental distinction between a between body and, and a tail risk yeah um, so that's that's what risk looks like which is if you like towards the left hand side of that that previous gap um, contrast that and you can represent if you wanted to you could represent that distribution by a triangle just for it but for ease of calculation but but if, you, if, you've, if you've got the real distribution, you wouldn't do that. Contrast that with uh, what, what I call a plausibility distribution or a possibility distribution, where you're saying, here is a set of potential outcomes which are plausible given what I know, not based on data, but given my judgment. Um, and there is the most plausible distribution to which I can ascribe the number one. And the limits, if you like, credible limits to which I'll ascribe a value of zero. Um, 
So that's what I think Keynes was talking about, I think, when he talked about there is a certain domain within which you can make statements about the relative plausibility of different outcomes, even if you don't, you aren't able to ascribe it an explicit probability, probability to them. And then, then you've got the things which are more like, which are really in the black swan territory. So I'm calling the, the, the lower one type one uncertainty and the, the black swan stuff, which is possible but implausible, I'm calling that type two uncertainty. And effectively, what I'm saying is I think you need to d deal with those two things differently. There's a different approach to them. So this is the one I'm mainly interested in. Um, and now I'll bring in fuzzy sets, right? So here is a fuzzy fairy story, um, and it's not because of the bears. Uh, it's because I'm, I'm because Goldilocks, uh, without realizing it, was a fuzzy set theorist in advance of her time. So, as you know, she came into the bear's house and she tasted the porridge. She didn't have a thermometer, so she didn't actually know how hot the porridge was, but she was able to say, I know what cold is, I know what hot is, and, my, and I know what my personal preference is, which is just right, somewhere in the middle. So it is a 50% membership of the fuzzy set called hot, and a 50% membership of the fuzzy, fuzzy set called cold, and that defines the temperature that she sampled. And its root, that's what, that's what fuzzy sets is. It's, it's defining an entity in terms of its membership of one or a number of fuzzy sets. So you can use that. So you can capture judgment, this is my premise, by using, uh, having defined membership functions, which is what these fuzzy sets are, and determining by judgment to what extent something, has, its degree of membership of different sets. And so you can, you can make a judgment expressed in normal language, which can be quantified. And if you can quantify them, you can manipulate them. You could map those against the real variable of temperature, and that's called in the jargon, the impenetrable jargon of fuzzy sets, defuzzification. Or it could be that you don't ever try to map that against a real measurable variable. You just stick with your, your membership values and work with those. So for instance, there isn't an equivalent to temperature for the consistency of porridge, and there probably never will be. It's not the kind of thing that's useful for anybody to invent. Um, so you can, you can still manipulate and, 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 and work with those definitions without having a crisp variable against which to map it. Um, so my contention is you can, taking that kind of approach, you, and applying it to the problem of uncertainty into the future, we can re reflect uncertainty as a triangle um, that, um, well, three triangles, two of which are type two uncertainty, which we'll put to one side at the moment, one of which is type one uncertainty, which is under normal, these, this is the level of uncertainty, level of variability that I expect under normal circumstances. So how do you then convert that to something that you can actually use? Um, so you start off with um, three views of a state of a variable, the most likely, almost plausible value, and the best case or the worst case, but these are not the worst possible case. It's still conceivable that things will happen that will be outside that range. And if you're going to use fuzzy sets, you need to have some clarity about the definition of what that criteria is. Um, and that's easy to understand, simple to estimate. That's converted into a plausibility distribution, a possibility distribution, um, which can reflect the characteristics of uncertainty. So there could be a lot of uncertainty, so the triangle base could be wide, or there could be relatively little uncertainty, so the triangle base will be narrow. It could be skewed one way or the other. All aspects of uncertainty which myself and my colleagues would routinely ignore when we were doing our work simply because we didn't have a means to capture it and manipulate it. Um, 
translating that into, uh, so just explaining some of the language around fuzzy sets. A fuzzy set has, is usually a triangle, but it can be a quadrilateral. Um, sorry, a trapezoid. Um, it's usually expressed, expressed as a triangle because that's relatively easy to manipulate mathematically using simple geometry. Um, so it's expressed as a triangle. Uh, the area of that triangle is uh, easy to calculate, as is the possibilistic mean. Um, and as a result of that, you can then begin to make some inferences based upon your judgment as expressed in the fuzzy set. So for instance, you could say, if you think that that is the, let's, let's say that that fuzzy set rep represents the degree of uncertainty around the sales of a new product, for which you've got no historical information at all. You can say, if, if that, where that dotted line comes, which is called the alpha cut, represents success by comparing the areas of those two tri triangles you can answer the question how likely is it that this product will succeed how likely is it that it will fail and you can do things like yeah so let me just make sure and you can say if it does fail so it is, if it's in the, that part of the future which is represented by the triangle x what is the likely average mean cost of that failure? So what's, if I do fail, what am I likely to, what's the cost of that failure? So, but just using simple geometry and simple triangles, you can begin to make inferences which are useful. So for example, with, with something like this, to go back to my capital proposal uh, example, if I'm doing a number of capital proposals, uh, each of which has got an internal rate of return. And I know I can't afford to invest in all of them. I can begin to make choices taking into account not only the, uh, the average internal rate of return, but also the uncertainty attached to those. So I can begin to, begin to um, make portfolio type decisions in a way that wasn't possible before. Uh, I can also do things like say, um, if I've got, what is the value of having flexibility? So again, in business, quite often when you, you're making, evaluating a decision, you assume, you're making the assumption, I have to make this decision now, and I either say yes or no. But in reality, you almost always have flexibility, or you could construct a decision so that you do have flexibility. Yeah, in, 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 in financial markets, it's called an option. Yeah. So you can begin to do things like say, what's the, what is the value of having flexibility if that flexibility allows me to avoid the outcome, an outcome going in the triangle called X. Yeah. So what's the possibilistic mean? And actually, what that, the, the inverse of that is actually the real option value which is something which, as you probably know, Black Scholes got a Nobel Prize for, but, and which is used extensively in financial markets, but nobody ever uses in business because it's impossibly complicated and you don't have the data to be able to calculate it. So by just really using really, really simple geometrical principles, you can actually come up with a real option value. And there are numerous things you can do with that. So if I'm just, Pause for a draw breath for the second. For a second, so thinking about uncertainty in those terms allows you to do a number of useful things, which otherwise wouldn't be possible. So you can say, "What's the potential? Uh, I've got a new product. What's the potential of selling more than a certain value? What safety stock should I hold if I don't want to run out of stock?" What's the potential of, of success? If it fails, what do I stand to, to, to lose? You can do away with your, uh, if you're only using single points, you're effectively, uh, you're effectively doomed to using the mode of your distribution. Whereas if you think about it in these terms, you can, you can use the 
Uh, you can construct a, a weighted average. You can ask questions like, what's the value of a patent? Um, where all of the, uh, the value is, is the potential value in the future. How, and how much, how much should I pay to avoid the downsides, which is what insurance is. So there are a whole bunch of, I've just threw, thrown a, a, a few on the screen there, a whole bunch of useful things you can do thinking about uncertainty in those terms. But there, there is a, another group of things that you can't do. Yes, sorry. Yeah, so um, it's not literally insurance. So it's saying if, if I could construct a decision such that I avoid a downside, how much is that worth to me? So that's, if you like, uh, buying insurance. Because what insurance does, it compensates you for downsides. Yeah, it compensates you for risk. Yeah, risk that has been realized. So I'm using insurance in a very loose sense here. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other things that you can't do unless you can add or multiply fuzzy sets. Um, and the kind of things that I would, I would have liked to have done in my old job um, requires us to do that, to add or um, multiply fuzzy sets. So for instance, the, what we were talking about earlier, Jim, I've got a series of uh, profit forecasts, all of which have got a range around them. Well, how do they add? What's the risk for the total company? Yeah, how do I work out what that is? Conversely, if I say I've got, uh, I'm happy as a as a big company to uh, have profits that fall within this range. How do I? So that's if you like, I'm expressing my target for the total company as a range. If I've got a number of business units, how do I decide? what they target range is. Um, if I've got a range for my revenue forecast and I've got a range for the cost forecast, how do I multiply those two together to get a range for my profit forecast? And if I've got a range, I've got an idea of what a range of sales volumes could be and I've got an idea of what a range of sales prices could be, how do I work out what the range for the revenue is? So, there's a whole bunch of useful things I'd really like to do that I can only do if I can add or multiply these fuzzy sets together. Yeah, which sounds easy, but this is where it gets to get difficult. And this is where I pick up the phone to Paul and say, help. And by the way, I, before Paul says it, Paul just helps me with the maths. He, he's, he's, he's got no stake. He's not in any way endorsing what I've done with it. <laughs> He just helps me because he can't help himself. He's that, he's that kind of guy. So what I was trying to get away from was this, is if you like what you would normally do if this was a probability distribution, you'd get some kind of, you'd get some kind of Monte Carlo tool and you'd bash these two uh, subsidiary triangles together and do some complicated calculations having worked out what the exact covariance of those two are. And you would end up with something that well, A, you'd start off with something that most normal people like me would not have to use safely. And you would end up with a result that you couldn't use because it's lost that property, that simple property, triangular property, which is what gives it its power. Um, so the process is opaque and complex and the output is unpredictable. So you don't know what it's, the output's going to look like. But it, it's, and it's incommensurate. It's a kind of different shape to what you've put into the process. So what I was looking to do with Paul's help was to say, actually, what, what these fuzzy sets represent, they do not represent uh, individual, they do not represent probability distributions, individual events that are accumulated. They're, they're an expression of relative probability. So if you like, they're a kind of uh, a, a, a uh, they, they represent event space within a total state space, as it were. And if you think about it in that way, what I was looking to do was to find a way to add or multiply A and B in such a way to get a compound fuzzy set AB, which, um, which, which reflected the qualities of A, a and B. And so by effectively, 
um, the question I'm trying to answer is, by how much do I have to shrink the bases? So how much do I have to shrink the base in order to get a result which is um, arithmetically sound and, and, and in a way which, is, which, which I can still use? So, um, so that's what I was trying to do. Uh, there's theoretical justification, justification, but I won't go into that. So, this, yes, sorry. So, um, you're saying that it is applied in control engineering. How, are, how is that done in control engineering? Um, in a complicated way. So more like on the side, so you're not maintaining. Not exactly. Not exactly. Um, let, I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Okay. Um, also, they're using it in a, in a slightly because it, it, it's 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 in it's in logical it's in logic control systems. It's more s sequential logic. If this, then that. They're not adding. They're not multiplying. It's it's in a logical. They're using the, the fuzzy sets in a yeah, logical okay, manner. Okay. So there's no yeah. need for aggregation yeah. per se. Yeah. Oops. Okay, right. So, um, can we use these to the side? All right. Okay. Right. So, in, in doing this, just empirically, working with sets like this. The kind of practical problems that we came across is we, things we need to take into account when multiplying or adding sets. We need to take account of the variance of the uh, input sets. We need to take account of the covariance. And that's particularly problematic if you've got lots and lots of sets you're trying to combine the number of relationships explodes exponentially. And also, if you don't have actual data, how do you know what the covariance is? Um, you have to take account of the relative size. In the case of aggregation, that makes a big difference. So if you're, if you're adding things together that are relatively similar size, it's not an issue. But if you're adding things together that have different, have, are, are of a different size, then you've potentially got problems. The number of entities when you're aggregating is also an issue. And if you're multiplying, the skews, are, the skews of, the, of the input triangles are also an issue. So what, are we, what I was trying to do is to come up with some simplifying assumptions that allowed me to come up with a methodology which I could imagine simple people like me using in practice in the form of factors that we could apply. I'm going to talk to this because it's getting confusing. In the, in the form of factors. And what we found empirically is that the standard deviation, which is obviously related to the variance, is tightly correlated with the range. Yeah? So if we knew the standard deviation, we can calculate the range and vice versa very easily. Covariance, my simplifying assumption, is that in practice, the best that you can possibly do is to decide whether, some, whether, whether the things you're trying to add and multiply are uncorrelated, strongly positively correlated, or strongly negatively correlated. And if you could do one of those three things, then, then, I, then, then that is manageable from a practical point of view. Relative size is only an issue if the relative size different differences are very large, and the, t the the two things that you're trying to add together are negatively correlated. So that's a very limited set of circumstances. Number of entities are known. And skew only becomes an issue if the skew is very large and it's in the same direction. So all of those potential problems are ones that, through a range of simplifying assumptions, I think I can deal with. As a result, when it comes to multiplication, so if you're trying to multiply two things, that depending upon whether you believe that the things that you're multiplying are uncorrelated, positively correlated, or negatively correlated, and it's not, and, and the things that you're multiplying are not highly skewed, you can simply use a factor. 
and apply that factor to the combined range. So it's a factor of 0.877105 Po. If there is, if it is highly skewed, then you have to use that formula and good luck with that. In terms of addition, um, providing the things you're trying to add aren't negatively correlated and there aren't large size differences. Similarly, there is a set of factors that you can use to, um, when you're adding your um, triangles together. So in summary, I think there is a reasonably simple and reasonably robust approach to adding and subtracting uncertainty as expressed as fuzzy sets. So that's all I'm going to do for the moment. And we haven't got much more time anyway. So I'll just leave it like that and open it up to questions. Could you talk about the practical applications you see this, like give some examples, use cases? Right, okay, so I've got about three or four slides where, which I could talk through, but I, I won't do that because there's a shortage of time. So if I go back to my, um, my example of capital proposals, the first time I used this, there was a, a company who said, they're, they're a pharmaceutical company, and they, they don't, uh, they license most of the products they sell. They don't, um, they, they don't do the research themselves. So people come to them saying, Here, here's a product, we want you to sell it. It's past the phase three trials. And then they have the issue of how much do they pay for that. Now, uh, they do a standard DCF calculation. So they're saying that the most likely outcome comes up with value X. And they then do a sensitivity analysis, which gives them a whole bunch of other, uh, 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 other potential outcomes that range from, uh, let's, let's say the, the most likely outcome is 150 million uh, internal rate of return. Um, but then they have a range of outcomes which ranges from 50 million to 220 million, let's say. How do they... So they've got a, a range of potential um, uh, MPVs. How do they decide how much to pay? Yeah. The trouble with a, a typical, a, a, gen, a, a normal sensitivity analysis, you've got lots of alternative outcomes, but you cannot attribute any kind of likelihood to those. So the first time we, we used this in anger, what we basically did is we took the, 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 the lowest value from that sensitivity analysis, the highest value and the most likely value, use that to construct a fuzzy set. And then you can say, then, then you, could, you can begin to do things so, that says that the maximum that you should pay is the, most, is the uh, MPV, the most likely outcome, 150 million. But that's just the maximum. How much... Um, so therefore, you, you, you would pay, you would ideally pay less than that. The question then is how much less? And that depends on your appetite for risk. So you can then begin to do calculations which says if you're prepared to accept a 30% chance that you will lose money on this, this is how much you should pay. You can do things like say, if you can come up with a deal which with the supplier the person who's coming to you with, who's, who's making this product, you can do a, a deal that, whereby they will uh, assume all of the risk below a certain level. How much then would you pay? So you can begin to do a whole load of what-if calculations based on the, your, your appetite for risk and, be, and, and which can inf inform the negotiation that you have with the people that, the people that you are... Um, buying this thing from. So that was the first time we used it, and the, um, the, the, the company concerned, I mean, they didn't know you could do that kind of thing, so they were absolutely delighted. So you begin to ask and answer questions which you cannot answer using any kind of traditional approach to um, uncertainty. And there are tons and tons of applications 
in the whole in the area of uh, profit management, revenue management, in into day to day steering of businesses, lots and lots. Any other questions? Thank you, okay, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you.